playing any of those video games? I one in particular I remember was like a firework simulation, mm -hmm. and I remember it was the first time I saw something animated on that screen versus the black and white text that's always there primarily. And I just was I was sitting on my dad's lap, and he he like clicked a button, and I remember just being wowed by the rainbow of colors and thinking, wow, there's so much that you can do with this thing. And I would like play with my cousin and sister in that I would make these games where I would say like, if, you know, if I type this in the Pokemon world will open up and you can go inside and just make something up like that. And they would be so wide eyed. And it was my way of like, um, introducing them to, um, I guess you could say magic or something mysterious and new. The magical world of technology. I guess so. I know a lot of people make uh, data science jokes that it's black magic. Mm -hmm. So, so you went from an MS DOS system, and how did you get into your passion and love of data science? Because if I remember correctly, you studied CS at Columbia. Mm -hmm. Well, I started off um, with finance as I was a finance major, actually freshman year of college and got to make that money, huh? You got to make that money, especially coming from a lower middle class family where my parents were always hounding me about money and saying they would never pay for my college unless I got into an Ivy League school. And it was drilled into my head since I was a second grader. Like I was in second grade and I was like, I am going to Harvard or Columbia or something. Mm -hmm. Whereas everyone else is like, what's, you know, five plus five. <laughs> um, so definitely my mom's, it's all because of my mom. That intent was always there. And in terms of data science and my motivation to start that, I went from finance to computer science just because I spent a semester abroad in Europe couch surfing. And one of the people, the first person I stayed with, his name was Alex McCaw in London. And he was the first person I'd stayed with outside of the United States. And he, I remember he had this Hackintosh that he had built and he showed me the screen. Are you familiar with Hackintoshes? No. Well, I've heard plenty about them. It's a hack together Macintosh, right? Yes, exactly. Well said. <laughs> That's, that should be like the trademark of it. But, um, and I remember thinking, this is so amazing and cool. I can't believe you can put Windows on a Mac and then run all of these apps that this guy had built in like a matter of 24 hours, like a, you know, a um, automatic blog post um, filler tool, like these design tools, just these very creative technologies with code. And that's when I'm, I was I was awakened to the fact that you could make something incredible. And he said he was envious of me, Alex, who was the smart programmer because I was an American and I had access to San Francisco. And in San Francisco, you could um, earn like a six figure income doing this stuff. And he wished that he could do that. I mean, fast forward to 10 years. I mean, Alex has written the book on JavaScript, the O'Reilly book. He um, worked at Stripe, which is one of the IPO unicorns of San Francisco, one of the great modern stories of a fintech company, which Stripe powers something like 50% of transactions on the web now. Wow. Um, uh, and then now Alex has IPO'd his own company, Clearbit, which is a data API. You just put in your email and you get all of this social data. Just a brilliant guy. But I was lucky enough to meet him 10 years ago at the very start. And just, it's insane how one person in your life can change so much, isn't it? And they feed into you a lot of different information and awaken different parts of you. Mm. And it brings so much to light and can definitely change you as a person, hopefully for the better. Yeah, he definitely did. I, I had, um, you know, I was suspended from Columbia when I was a freshman and I was very lost. And this was a way for me to reset. And computer science was just something that I'd, always loved I, I didn't know if I could have could be good at it like maybe this was just wasn't how my brain worked but it was just through grit and passion and you know I think more than anything it's just grit to just sit there and like program and fail and fail and fail and fail but just to have this meaning behind it um, that made me continue because there was just so many cool things that I could do so I started with computer science and then I just built everything that I possibly could Iowa my first app was called Ibaton. Um, where you took your iPhone and you could select a song on Spotify and then moving your phone like a conductor's baton, you can you could speed up or slow down the tempo of the music in real time. Is that because you ha were in marching band and had a lot of passion for music as well and so it put two of your passions together? 
Absolutely. I've always loved music. Um, you know, in a different life, I'd be a composer or, you know, a conductor of some kind. What is your favorite uh, artist for classical music? I would say my favorite artist for classical music would be um, Franz Liszt. He was a German composer. Mm -hmm. um, most of his music is very sad. Oh, it's weird. Like I consider myself a generally happy person. Like mm -hmm. I'm hardly ever depressed. It's kind of hard for me to be depressed, but I just love sad music. I'm, I'm not sure why. I just I listen to it and I feel emotional and I you know want to cry. Um, but then it makes me feel happy. That's a, an odd thing to say about sad music, that it eventually makes you happy. Yeah, it eventually makes me happy. And I kind of, I found that I kind of need to be a little bit sad to get into a creative state. I'm not sure that's what, I'm not sure why my mind works like that. I think it's like the tortured artist, even though it's a trope, it's a true thing. Like a lot of artists, um, even myself in particular, when I get into my flow for painting or working in any sort of medium, there is a certain level of sadness uh, that feeds into the creativity. And uh, the tortured artist trope definitely <laughs> encompasses that. And I mean, between all of the wonderful stories about artists cutting off their ears or having unrequited love, um, definitely fits into that space. Yeah, yes. Do you consider yourself a tortured artist? I think that um, I can be tortured just by my own thoughts and my own overthinking. Uh, I tend to have a mind that races and I'm hardly ever in reality. I'm always like in different layers of abstraction, trying to connect the dots between different things. S you know, something's very esoteric like consciousness or free will or um, just philosophy. And then, um, but at the same time, I've learned to be a little bit more grounded in my thinking. That's all, always a process. I, I don't consider myself a tortured artist as much as I would like to say. I, I've been very privileged, I think, in my life. I think you've had quite a lot of success. Thank you. Um, I know me personally, when I think, like my thoughts are so spaced out that if I say them out loud, people get terribly confused because they're not linear. Mm. Uh, have you found that to be useful in any way or is it just like annoying or it's like i'm running a bunch of threads in parallel mm. and then at different points in my thoughts i try to share them mm -hmm. and and no one understands the parallels between them and jumping through the many different threads that i'm running mm -hmm. uh, so i try to keep it mostly to myself i guess yeah <laughs> or take notes on it so that way i can go back and work on projects and things like that but uh Definitely not good for a brainstorming session. <laughs> right, because you're probably working on a lot, right? Just Yeah, I have quite a few things going uh, <laughs> between yeah. working full time, a podcast and running a meetup. And maybe if everyone didn't know, I'm a single mom. So uh, definitely quite a few uh, plates up in the air. Yeah, that's I mean, that's hard. It's admirable. I feel like there should be more of that, like, I guess, single moms who are you know, in like the workplace and like our career women. And do you feel like there, there's like enough of that out there? Like that there's more enough of an example or that there should be more? I really wish more people admitted to being parents. And then like even the dads like admitted to being parents and being passionate about being parents, but also saying that they're career driven. Mm -hmm. Um, I know I was at both of my parents' workplaces growing up, and they had career jobs. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think there's anything wrong um, with being both career-driven and being a very driven mom. Uh, my daughter definitely went to the zoo, went to a live concert, and saw fireworks this weekend oh and she went to the natural history museum as well That's a lot. Uh, so and i also you know did my full job and everything else and thanks for listening to sarah in tech feel free to email me at sarah at sarah in or follow me on instagram at sarah in tech hope you enjoyed listening <laughs>